history. The recording will be available on Smart History and on our YouTube channel as always. So um, anyone who missed it can find it there. We just wanna say a big welcome to everybody who's here and thank you for coming to the first Smart History Commons webinar of the series. This was um, entirely the idea of our two co-presenters who were thrilled to have here with us, um, Dr. Tamara Diaz Calcano, and I, I, I did it wrong again. I said Tamara instead of Tamara. Um, uh, is a professor of art history and humanities at the University of Puerto Rico, uh, Rio Piedras campus. She received her PhD in art history from the Complutense University of Madrid, where she focused on 19th century Caribbean visual culture and the artistic exchange between that region and Europe. She's currently the Smart History Fellow for the Art of the Caribbean. Dr. Maya Jimenez is lecturer of art history at the Borough of Manhattan Community College, CUNY. She's also an educator at the Museum of Modern Art and contributing editor for 20th Century Latin American Art for Smart History. She received her PhD from the CUNY Graduate Center where she focused on the transatlantic dialogues between Latin American and European modern art. We're so excited about the subject of today's presentation on the great artist Francisco Oyer. Um, and anx so anxious to learn more. So thank you so much to both of you. Um, and I'll turn it over to you. And we'll do Q&A at the end. We should have about 10 minutes for Q&A. All Q&A can go in the Q&A area and then we'll feed them to our panelists. Thank you so much, Beth and Stephen. Um, for hosting us in the Smart History webinar. And thank you to everyone who is here. I see some familiar names and I see many colleagues and students from BMCC. So I do wanna say hi to you all. Let me go ahead and share my screen first. Okay. Everyone can see this. Excellent, okay. so. Oyed is an artist that is, of course, very dear to me and probably more to Tamara, um, but I think he's also a great artist for us to honor, especially now that we are celebrating Latinx Heritage Month. So I also wanted to make that connection. Um, he's also an artist that really needs no introduction. He is a celebrated painter in his native Puerto Rico. He's very much an icon in Caribbean art. And today he's gonna to be our entry point into 19th century Latin America. If you're not familiar with Oyer, that's also fine. That is why you're here. Oyer was a transatlantic cosmopolitan artist. He traveled twice to Europe, um, both times visiting Spain and France. Yet he was also deeply rooted to his native Puerto Rico, always returning back home. And that's an important point that we'll expand on more today. Our goal today is to take a fairly well-known artist and complicate, or better yet, expand our understanding of Oyer beyond French Impressionism. We're gonna look at his connections to French realism and Spanish painting, and also take a closer look at his nationalist and abolitionist sentiments. Like his contemporaries, and this was very common among 19th century Latin American artists, Oyer studied in Paris at independent art studios like the Atelier Couture, and he also studied at the Academy Suisse. And that's where he met Monet and Pizarro, probably two of the most celebrated French Impressionist painters. And you can see him in this great photograph in the company of Pizarro. He also came into contact with Gustave Courbet, though he did so more informally um, at brasseries, just through the social network of 19th century Paris. So Oyer's trip abroad also coincided with independence movements in Latin America and just a very brief history of Puerto Rico in the 19th century with some important dates. And that's really that the struggle for independence, which starts in 1868 with the Grito de Lares really culminates, of course, with the Spanish-American War in 1898. This painting that you're seeing here was actually done by a student of Oyer. 
So today's presentation is about the many different elements that we see in this work, Oyer's most canonical work. It's called The Wake. It is an ambitious, large painting. He completed it towards the end of his career, and it's really considered a culmination of all his genres and styles. He finishes the work in 1893, and he exhibits it first in Puerto Rico in 1893, then in Cuba in 1894, and then in Paris. It was not shown publicly in Paris, we don't think, but it was shown at least privately to Cezanne, who really was not impressed with this canvas. And I think that's hard to believe considering how beautiful and impressive it is. But I also think that's the point of today's presentation, right? The idea that this painting, which was informed by his experiences abroad and by the artistic lessons that he absorbed there was ultimately and most importantly, a painting about Puerto Rico and for the Puerto Rican people. So that's really gonna be our focus today. Um, I would like to briefly thank Smart History for this opportunity to talk about Oyer and his work, his diverse styles, and also well, I would like to thank uh, Maya for her collaboration in this talk. And I will now continue with the presentation entering uh, the Wake as Oyer's most important painting. As Maya said, Stefan was not particularly impressed with the Wake when he when he saw it for the first time. But we know that when Oyer presented, exhibited this work in 1893 for the first time, we have a reviewer called Isabel Brau who spoke about how well received it was among the Puerto Rican public and how people had really a lot of fun pointing out how they knew people, just like the ones represented in the painting. So this is very much a composition that is talking to the Puerto Rican context. And so his most famous painting allows us a window to approach three important themes in his work. He brought up the country folk in Puerto Rico, particularly farmers, the haciendas as human, as human features of the landscape, natural features of the land, of the land like palm trees, and then fruit of the land itself in his still life work. As we know, the, the way tackles itinerary tradition in, Puerto, in the Puerto Rican countryside, a little angel wake done for children younger than seven years old. It has the roots in the Spanish countryside. It was also a setting for syncretism where people of African ancestry incorporated their own rhythm, songs, and stories. Or they're set the scene in the interior of the bohío, the typical farmer house. There is grief, joy, music, food. Oyer takes great care in representing the material culture of the Jibaro home, the food they will partake in in this event. His attention extends also to the landscape where the boio is. Through the windows and doors of the, of the house, we find the gentle hills of the Puerto Rican countryside, where we find more Jibaros, boio, trees, and palm trees. We also notice a distinct contrast in style. While the inside of the boio and the figures are presented in a realist style, the landscape is far more impressionistic in brushwork. And this is something that becomes very distinct in his work. This is the style that he prefers when he represents his native landscape. This attention to the jibaro and the countryside is also found in literature. We are in a context where people in Oyer's social circle, the local intellectuals, writers, poets, and politicians are thinking about what is distinct of Puerto Rican society in contrast to the Spanish metropolis. This informed by the growing independence and autonomous movement and the interest in defining cultural identity. And we all, and they all find in the Ibaro, the icon of Puerto Rican identity. We find these explorations in titles like the ones you have on screen, particularly the Jibaro by Manuel Alonso. is very important in the codification of the Jibaro as the Puerto Rican type. It focuses on country tradition, what the Jibaro sounds like, what the Jibaro does in the land he inhabits. We find that this is not limited to literature. We also see it extending to visual culture as early as the 18th century. 
We have here an illustration by Spanish painter Luis Pared de Alcázar, who lived for three years at the end of the 18th century in Puerto Rico. And we find the Jibaro dress as particular of the Puerto Rican territory. Here he is dressed in white with his straw hat, a rooster, and a sword taking the place of the more practical and typical machete. Oyer also takes on the subject in a similar way to Luis Pared before he did the wake in this uh, a more ornamental painting from the 1880s. Here we also find the Jibaro in white with his straw hat, a rooster in arm, and a machete. And he's also set in a very impressionistic approach to nature. This type, the, the strength of this type, of this cultural type extends into the 20th century. We can see that here in, a, in Ramon Frade's work, Our Daily Bread from 1905. This is a painting already in the US colonial context in Puerto Rico, not even 10 years from the Spanish American War. His Jibaro is monumental in his humble dress, but dignified in representation. Uh, here we have more typical pala. A uh, hat made from palm fronds. So we can very much see how the type of the Jibaro prevailed strongly in Puerto Rican art as a symbol of identity into the 20th century. In his second stay uh, in France, Oyer met again with Pizarro, who by the late 1870s and early 1880s was placing the French farmer as the main focus of many of his competitions. Here we have uh, a comparison between Oyer's more impressionistic Jibaro and Pizarro's work. This, along with Spanish costumbrismo later on, could also be important references for Oyer's growing interest in the Jibaro. And so from the people who work the land, we pass on to the land itself, and the hacienda and the sugar mill have a very interesting and complicated place in Oyer's work. He turns his attention to it in a moment where the sugar industry is at a low point in Puerto Rico. At the end of the 19th century, coffee is king. And these are also private enterprises. So this is something very interesting and important to have in mind. This is very much appreciated in Hacienda Aurora from 1885, a commission work by the owner of the Hacienda. And we find it midwork. The workers are in action inside the property. They're harvesting and processing the sugar cane before it passes to the mill. And then in Hacienda Aurora, we have, we have a very different story. We are outside the property and what he represents of, what he represents is really the old mill that is no longer working. That, uh, that conglomerations of, st of structures that we find by the pink chimney. The mill seems structured transform into a relic through time, but it's still very much imposing in the landscape with its tall chimney. This is an industry that transforms the landscape itself with the cultivation of sugar, with its tall chimneys, and it influences greatly the lives of the workers. It's harvest and labor controlling their time and bodies. It's also an industry intimately tied to the legacy of slavery, which must also be Oyer's mind as he was interested in the abolitionist movement. Here we have another piece of his, uh, his period traveling the island around the 1880s and 1890s. Here posing his interest, his eye, into a more uh, discreet and smaller operation where we, where we still have more rudimentary technology for the sugar mill. So Tamara, considering that these three works were all painted after the abolition of slavery, what was Oyer's relationship with the abolitionist in Puerto Rico, what kind of position did he take on the subject? As far as we know, Oyer was interested uh, in abolition and he was very much an abolitionist in, in thought. In thought. Uh, we do not know uh, concretely if he was involved directly in the abolitionist movement. We do know that he created some sketches where he focuses his attention on the violence in, inflicted on enslaved people in plantations particularly, and he also cre created portraits for abolitionists like Roman Valladolid de Castro. So he seems to be related and very much interested in the subject. So his work do have an abolitionist approach, but we do not know in great detail about his direct involvement in the movement beyond the works he created. 
in the titles that I presented earlier and other publications made by people like Eugenio Maria de Osto, we also find many references to the Puerto Rican landscape and its beauty, trees like the Ceiba, like the cotton silk tree endemic of the Caribbean is present in literature as a natural monument representative of the Puerto Rican landscape. We can see that here in the Ponce Ceiba, a famous tree in the southern town of Puerto Rico. And Oyer takes his impressionistic, his impressionistic approach to capture this impressive tree so lush and green that the trunk and branches almost disappear in this bright painting. Just alluding to what you said earlier about how impressionism was the language of nature and the natural landscape. I think these are two great examples of that. You could really see the painterly brushstroke in both of these works, the way he captures light kind of shining through the trees or reflected off of the water. But I think if we look mo more closely, especially the landscape with royal palm tree, yeah. we notice the centrality of this palm tree in particular, the way it towers above the landscape, um, the way its trunk is very prominent and vertical, and also the way that the palm leaves themselves, right, are cast against this, this sky. So I want to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about Oyer and his relationship to Courbet, especially um, with regards to the palm tree. We know that by the 1860s, Courbet had turned his attention towards landscape painting, um, so this oak tree is from 1864. And if you just look at the way that Courbet has painted this oak tree, something that is really quite simple, but it's painted with tremendous care, um, especially the tree trunk is quite prominent and monumental. And I think you could argue that this is not only a landscape painting. This almost looks like the portrait of a tree, you know, if we were to think of it that way. And similarly, Oded honors the palm tree as more than a simple tree, but a majestic one, a truly symbolic one. And in this regard, you can see him revealing his contempor contemporaneity and his desire to depict, like Courbet, the places, the people, and the trees of his native region. And this is very much in line with the realist motto um, il faut être de son temps, which means if we were to translate it, one must be of one's own time. But I think we can also add to this motto of being of one's own place as well, right? So Courbet is an artist very much like Oyer that was not part of the artistic center of Paris, right? He painted in Ornan and he painted the people and the landscapes and the, you know, trees of his native region. So they share in that perspective of the outsider. And I think because of that, a sense of place, a sense of rootedness is so important because these are the things that they are personally attached to, but these are also the things that make them different from, I guess, perhaps Parisian artist. And you see that again in the still life paintings. These are my personal favorites of Oyer. This connection to the land um, is very much, it's very visible in the way that, for example, these plantains have been picked from the land. And he's showing you the way that they have this terrestrial connection. Um, so what we see in the fruits and in the trees is this literal and metaphorical rootedness to Puerto Rico. In other words, they're not simply fruit, but they're a reflection of the artist who painted them right, and who probably consumed these fruits, but also a reflection of the land in which these fruits originated. Yes, and I think that that concept of being of the land is very much present in this almost casual quality that the still life have, the way they almost seem, these fruits seem to be just brought in into the kitchen table and they are awaiting preparation. We see that simple wooden table there. We see the machete with which this bunch of coconuts was cut from the palm tree. So that aspect of, of being of the land seems very much present, even also in that quality of representing the cycle of the fruit, the life cycle of the fruit. We see that in the composition here of the coconuts, where we have the immature fruits 
still on the vine. Then we have the green coconut, more mature. And then we have the ripe fruit itself already cut open. We can see the, the meat inside. So we have this whole you know, representation of the life cycle of the fruit and how it's being consumed. There's this aspect of, of also mon of, of making the everyday monumental. I mean, we are here considering fruits that are very much part of the everyday diet of the Puerto Rican, then as in now. And so we have this very compact composition that seems to magnify the fruit itself. And that composition, that Thai composition, I think also refers or harkens back to another important reference in Auger's artistic education, which is uh, Spanish still life tradition. And I think we can appreciate that in this comparison with this still life by Luis Melendez, a series he did in the 18th, in the 18th century, was on view on the Prado when Auger was in his second stay in Madrid. And we find that quality that sort of compact composition that monumentalizes Spanish fair in the 18th century. I think that translates quite well uh, in the way Oyer approaches also the fruit of the land he is from. And I will also say, because I don't know if we've mentioned this, but Oyer came from a fairly privileged household, right? So when he depicts the Hibado, for example, that's a provincial type that he would have had probably little contact with or not at least direct contact with the plantains and the coconuts these fruits really transcend social status this is eaten in all I would you know venture to say all Caribbean households right so this is his opportunity to show us something that is both close to him but also very symbolic of the region and very nationalistic and I'll probably just end by saying, because this point usually surprises my students when I do, that plantains, despite the fact that they're a staple of the Caribbean diet, are actually not native to the Caribbean. So I think it's also interesting to mention that. And that aspect about Oyer being from more privileged families also very much important, as Maya said. He grew up in the capital of San Juan and during the 1880s and 1890s, he's traveling uh, more into the countryside. So he's becoming very much familiar with uh, the traditions and the way of life of the countryside. And that is the moment he starts to uh, become more interested in the Hibaro. So I think it's, it's not just coincidence that it is at this moment that he's paying attention to, to this to this population in the countryside, to the Hibaro, within the cultural context, and of course his own experience now traveling more into the countryside. And so now we return to the Hibaro, almost we return to the Bohío of the Wake, almost like returning home, where we find all these themes in one composition. We find the Hibaro is at the center, the land they live in and work in, the palms that define the landscape, the fruit that they harvest and eat, the combination of Oyer's own diverse education, and as he well describes it, the object of his love as an artist. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That was amazing. That was amazing. Um... Sorry, I couldn't find my video button for a moment. Um, yeah, I, I learned so much. And um, the idea of being of one's time, I think, was uh, really moved me when we were talking about Oyer and being of his place. And um, so that was fascinating. Thank you both so much. I have, we're going to turn it over to questions, but I have a question to start. And um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the connection between the Hebrew and the independence movement. Is that a question that makes sense? Yes, definitely. Um, the Hebrew was very much in the mind of, of politicians and, and local writers throughout the 19th century because there's a, a great preoccupation about really defining Puerto Rico's cultural identity as independent from Spanish identity. So 
because there is very much a desire to define what is Puerto Rican and what they are trying to protect with their own uh, desire toward independence or toward a more autonomous form of government. And so even though all, all this is happening also uh, in the more privileged circles in, from which Oyer also is part of. So we have people who are more socially and economically privileged uh, looking at the population of the island through identifying they are what is representative of this culture. And so we're gonna sort of make them an icon of the culture itself as a sort of, yeah, sort of visual imagery that is part of their own political mission. And I think this is also something we find happening in Latin America, both before and after the independence movement in the new republics of Latin America. I'm, I'm interested in the fact that they're, in his work, they're not sentimentalized at all. They're not, you know, they're, they seem so straightforward and, um, and not nostalgic in that way that we often see French peasants. I think uh, that that is a, a great observation because it also reminds us that the wake has an element of social criticism. While Auger is very much representing uh, a countryside tradition, he's not doing it in a way that upholds it. He's criticizing it as, some, as something that is ignorant, as a superstition that continues on in the countryside because also the church allows it. So there's an element of celebration of certain aspects of the countryside, of the hibaro, the home, the food, but there's also an element of, of critiquing what he considers a superstitious uh, a superstitious tradition. And I think that also reminds us from where Auger is standing and from where he's looking at the country, at the countryside population. Thank you. Wonderful. We have some great questions. And in fact, they're so good that I'm going to hold off on my own question for, for a moment. Let me just, let me just uh, summarize them for you. Uh, we'll do one at a time. Um, there's a wonderful uh, question that actually references the, the asker's own grandfather as a painter uh, in Puerto Rico. Um, but the question comes down to, could you provide any thoughts on other painters who followed in Oyer's footsteps to understand his continuing legacy, his impact? Um, yes, I think particularly the the painting produced in Puerto Rico in the first half of the 20th century is very much indebted with Oyer. Uh, we have painters like Ramon Frade, the one who painted our daily bread, who was very much inspired by Oyer's take of the landscape and of the country folk of the Jibaro. We also find people like Juan Rosado taking on as well the representation of the, the Jibaro. We have people like Miguel Po from Ponce, who continues on this more uh, this, this custom risk approach to the countryside and is very much uh, inspired by Oyer's work in the 19th century. So we do have a whole generation of artists after Oyer who continue on in the 20th century producing very similar work both in landscape and genre scenes that are focusing on the Jibaro. It's a huge influence. Thank you. Um, another wonderful question. Uh, and actually, this one sort of begins to sort of get at one of my my questions, which is the the wake being perhaps the, the most well-known painting um, is is an interesting conflict. You had mentioned that impressionism is most evident out the windows in the in the painting and and um but Cheryl Smith is asking specifically if um about the conundrum of the painting itself not being largely impressionism and yet Oyero is being seen as a as an impressionist painter and and so we have a we have this this realism and space made for impressionism and how are they seen together how are they understood it's this sort of complexity of styles that are being interwoven here um 
I don't know if my if, I, if my one. one I, I was just gonna point out that I think, and then you could take it on Tamara and and look more closely that this painting is full of contradictions. I think stylistic ones, thematic ones. It's a combination of genres. It's also like Tamara was saying earlier. It it kind of gives you this intimate glimpse into provincial life that's so true, that's so recognizable and relatable. But there's also this element of caricature and satire a little bit in the painting. So so it's okay to see these contrasts because I think they're all over. I don't know, Tamara, you can go ahead. Yeah, I think that that question is very interesting because it brings us back to what I think is a big debate concerning how we see Oyer from our history. And I see it in Puerto Rican art history itself, where we want to define him as one or as one or the other, as a realist or as an impressionist. But I find that he he does define being categorized as one or the other. He moves very fluidly between styles and he's extremely comfortable combining both of them in one composition. So I think a painting like like the wake it's also very hard to categorize it, it has elements of, of of realism but as well as impressionism it sort of harkens back to that combination of all his art, artistic influences and i think he's a difficult artist in that sense we want to categorize him put him in a box but his own work makes it very hard to do so because we have a lot of impressionistic landscapes but when we go to his more figurative work genre scenes and portraits, they are more realist, certainly. At times, he becomes almost costumbrista as well. And so I know this is not necessarily a satisfying answer, but I think Oyer just simply flows very comfortably between styles, and he defines a rigid definition. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, speaking of influence, um, one one question is coming up that's asking for more a little more elaboration on Pizarro and acknowledgement that Pizarro's studio was seen as a locus for Caribbean artists um, who were temporarily in in France and um, I think there was just more interest in in understanding more of that relationship and that impact. Um, personal details about how the relationship was between uh, Pizarro and Oyer do escape us. We do know that they met on his first day in in Paris, in France, uh, probably because, well, Pizarro, I think, if I'm not mistaken, knew Spanish, so a newcomer to Paris would certainly, certainly find some comfort in someone also from the Caribbean in Pizarro. And it seems that they made a very good, a very good friendship, and they continue to exchange letters after Oyer returned to Puerto Rico in 1865. When Oyer returns to France, for a second time, the first person he goes to is Pizarro, and it is from Pizarro's letter, letters to his son that we find out that Oyer has arrived in France in the spring of 1874. So it seems that the relationship and the friendship was there, though more details of it, uh, they escape us at the moment. We have not found more documentation that gave us a bigger and more detailed picture of how their friendship was. Let me run from that question. Thank you. Let me run from that question to a question that let me just read it directly. Um, how does this preoccupation with national identity intersect with Oyer's um, role as one of the country's first teachers of painting on the island? So his impact again, but now as a as a painting teacher, perhaps. Mm. Well, he, he's not. Well, he is perhaps one of the first most well-known teachers of painting in Puerto Rico. We do have uh, people like Campeche who had his own uh, atelier, his workshop at the end of the 18th century. He's training his nephews, for example. We also have people like Ramon Atiles, who is a less known uh, painter also working in the first half of the 19th century. We have some Spanish artists as well teaching painting in the Puerto Rico in Puerto Rico in the first half of the 19th century. What we see is uh, what seems to be a very genuine interest in teaching 
this is something that's very near and dear to his heart. And from very early on in his career, he's trying to establish art school in, in San Juan as a way to make artistic education accessible. And we know that he also opened his school and tried to make it accessible price-wise for the larger part of the population. So I think that's perhaps where we can maybe connect his own preoccupations with national identity in the sense that he's preoccupied with making artistic education more accessible to the population in places like San Juan. Thank you. And one, I think we have time for just one last question. We've gone a little over, but it's so good and interesting. Can you speak just a little bit about patronage? Um, because I think that might help to inform some of the questions that, that have already arisen. Well, patronage uh, in the case of Oyer has been a bit sort of difficult to, to document since a lot of his own personal uh, documentation has been lost or has not been identified. Um, we do see that what he's mainly being commissioned to paint are portraits, and that seems to be his main source of, of income when he establishes himself in Puerto Rico. We have cases like Hacienda La Fortuna as perhaps one of the few landscapes that are commissioned to Oyer, but it seems very much that he's that, that landscape is very much a personal preoccupation, so he's producing for himself and then selling later on, but portraiture seems to be uh, the main source of his income and of his patronage, of those people involved in the more socially privileged circles in Puerto Rico, politicians, and so on. Wonderful. Before we end today, I just wanted to remind everyone that we've got two upcoming webinars. Um, one on October 18th on our BIPOC reader, Teaching Practices and Strategies with Maya Harakawa, and another one on November 1st with um, Stuart Tyson Smith on Black Pharaohs, Nubia, Egypt, and Historical Racism. So I hope uh, you can join us for those. There are links on Smart History to register. And just a huge thank you both to you, to you both for um, teaching us so much today. And um, I hope that uh, we see Oyer in a lot more classrooms, undergraduate classrooms. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.